Hello there, today we're going to be looking at fleshing out our story and the fidelity level of our scenarios. This is probably the hardest video to give most advice on as it comes down to just get on with it and write it for the most part. However, there's some guidance that can help you keep on the straight and narrow and use as a template for going forward. First off, you're going to need a program that suits you for writing and there are many writing programs out there and each have their own drawbacks and benefits. Personally, I use Scrivener to produce the bulk of the scenarios. However, I do use Google Docs for creating outlines and Word for final formatting and editing. Scrivener, to me, has better structure to it and you can build a scenario brick by brick, leaving sections undone and flitting back and forward between them at ease to revisit them and add in extra language and clues and trails. It is a lot more robust uh, for using hyperlinks and embedded images as well for your research. However, one of my pet peeves is it doesn't handle copy and paste from websites well. So when you're doing your research, Google Docs can strip away formatting uh, where this can't, which is one of the reasons I prefer to do outlining and initial research using Google Docs instead. I prefer not to use traditional programs like Word or Google Docs to create the actual scenario as I skip around a lot and this means endless scrolling for me and it can be confusing due to its long format, losing places uh, and finding it hard to keep track of where I was and what exactly I've completed where again Scrivener you can tag things as drafted or second drafted etc and you can really keep tabs on what you have achieved and what you have not. However, that said, I know many people use Google Docs and love it and shun Scrivener as a personal choice. It's just something you're going to have to get used to and figure out which one you like best. There are many out there, as I said before. Google Docs has accessibility as a major advantage. It can be used from anywhere on most devices and it is why I use it exclusively for initial research and outline as I can move around and it is always there to open up and dump things into uh, so you can collect uh, data from anywhere and it's a great idea management tool. I use Word for formatting as the template for Mistonic repository is in Word and it is also one of the most robust grammar and spelling systems built into any software. This is one of the weaker features of Scrivener, it is very poor for this. And as I lean heavily on these things to offset my dyslexia, it is a very important feature for me and this means I will pick up whatever I put into Scrivener and uh, throw it through Word just to see what differences it would make and what my editor has missed as a final safety check. Another tool I use is text-to-speech sites. Where I cannot see errors because of my dyslexia, I can definitely hear them. And this is something you might want to look into if you're in a similar boat. Listening to your sentences spoken out uh, makes errors glow in the dark, and I highly recommend giving this one a try. After you're comfortable with your software and you are happy that you're using the ones which are for you, you might want to look at the format in which you'll be writing your scenario. There are three basic traditional Call of Cthulhu methods that are put to use in most of the published scenarios that they produce and these break down into the minimal style, the narrative style and the toolbox style. The minimal style is an older school format that leaves a lot to the keeper to customise and bulk out. It is mostly a framework to hang on ideas. You can see this in Scallion's Daughter. This is a, a fairly short scenario coming in I think 10 pages. It can't be more than about 6,000, 7,000 words and it is a highly complex story with a lot going on. However, most of the things like the complexes or the, the ranches in it are underdeveloped and this is on the keeper to flesh out. The This is useful if you have a limited word count and it opens up possibilities of multitudes that the author just cannot cover and leaves the, the keeper uh, to sort these things out themselves. Uh, if this is used but underdeveloped, I usually call this like a, a stone soup method uh, where you're basically giving a, a, almost just a seed and uh, you're fooling the keeper into actually writing their own scenario 
on your idea rather than developing it yourself. There is also the narrative style. This is the most common format found in Call of Cthulhu 7th edition, which is a middle ground which excels in progression of story at a, a natural pace and will lead the keeper and the players uh, through a set of scenario events that will come together into a full story. And this can tend to be more railroading than most, however it's down to the actual keeper to keep that in mind and be a little bit more free flow. You can see this in my scenario, uh, 4 hours at Reno, it is actually quite railroady, uh, literally uh, going up the train one direction and down the train the other direction, and they bump into events along the way where it might not feel like it's uh, railroaded because you can jump and skip around in certain places. It definitely is following a very tight uh, schedule. Lastly, the toolbox style is quite common when you have one location and roaming events. This can be seen in the Saturn's Chalice, which is uh, a very good scenario, and it shows the use of this method in a very well-rounded way. It is most commonly used recently by the Alien RPG. All of their scenarios are written in this toolbox style which is another reference point you might want to look at if you want to use this method. Where the location is set out and they offer mundane advice and mundane finds, the events are free roaming and can be found in most of these locations uh, if and where the GM wants them to appear. It is one I favour heavily uh, sometimes when dealing with a, a single location. Choosing one of these styles to suit your scenario's actual premise is important. If you have a, a slow burn and progressive story which leads through clues which are fairly linear and you have that sort of growing uh, paced scenario which goes to that sort of ultimate finale, I would definitely use the narrative style to tell the story in a structured way that the keeper can follow from start to end. However, if you are moving around and your locations change constantly and you have floating events which can be placed anywhere, the toolkit is definitely the most valuable of the structures uh, that you can employ. However, if time is short and wards are limited, I would definitely look at the, the more minimalistic style, giving only key points uh, to get across what you actually want the keeper to elaborate on. If you really want to go down that path, which many of you might with a shorter style scenario, I would highly recommend looking at Mothership RPG and their pamphlet uh, scenarios, which are a fairly good indicator of what you can do with very minimalistic board choices and uh, some good layout and, and imagery. At this point you should be ready to just get on with it, as I said before. Uh, using your outline and what we did in the previous videos to create uh, scenes and breakdowns of where you want the action and events to happen. You need to build these scenes out with descriptions, uh, taste, tear, feel, sound, sights, gut feelings, uh, all sort of play into a part on how you're describing the scenes. Make sure they are utilitarian for the keeper to use properly and they make sure they point out what the NPCs that are there are doing, what motives they have and reasons what they have for interacting with that scene. On top of this you want to be adding in that historic information into the text to add texture to the scene and offer setting clues and hints for the keeper and the players to bite into and it will solve a lot of problems uh, going down the way. The keeper notes as well uh, are you can offer advice on potential problems to the keeper itself, talking directly to them and telling them how you would solve uh, these things. Always offer tells that will keep the story moving forward and never leave the players hanging with no way to proceed. The keeper and the players should always have some progression happen from a scene, uh, no matter what roles you actually provide or actually call out. The basics of what they find there should be enough uh, to give them a, a path of least resistance, even if that path is one towards failure and their own demise or perhaps a, a miserable uh, ending for them or a red herring perhaps or a false assumption. All these things are fine as long as they have a route out of the scene that you are providing and they're not left just twiddling their thumbs with no clue of where to progress. That is the sign or hallmark of a broken scenario. You must have that uh, lowest denominator there so they can actually enjoy the scenario rather than get stuck. One of the main things I see newer people doing when 
designing scenarios is putting down a key bottleneck to one dice roll, a door that has to be opened but is a strength check and is failed. And with that failure, everything comes to a grinding halt. Never offer that to a player. Always make sure there is at least two or three ways to get around something and uh, what would happen. Uh, and always go through it in your mind at, from a player's point of view and make sure you understand that if the scenario scene has no way out other than that one dice roll, then you probably need to expand it in some way. The opening scene to your scenario is one of the most important, if not the most important scene that you will ever write. If you fail to grab the players here, you will have an uphill struggle getting them to care or engage with your content beyond this point. First impressions last, always have a strong NPC and a visceral scene to lead them in. When you're opening, you need to offer the players a promise that you're going to fulfill during the scenario. This is how the players will have a, a little bit of a tell of what they're getting into. If they get this and it is not paid off or it is completely false, then the players, much like the readers of a book, would perhaps be feeling cheated uh, of what they were actually getting involved in. It is very hard to pull off twists which uh, completely take a, a right turn and the promises should be fulfilled or escalated into something bigger and better from what you promise at this opening scene. For example, in Grave Robbers I offered up the idea the bank robbers were using a hearse as a getaway vehicle and that there was someone within the bank who was perhaps working with them. This is enough of a clue of where the scenario is going and it gives them a in or the thin edge of the wedge of the scenario so they know exactly what they should be doing within the first 20 minutes and it is a lead they can follow from the start. If they do not know exactly how to proceed from this opening scene there is a massive problem and your scenario will just end up just grinding to a halt here and as the players are left with too many options to actually comprehend and actually follow or they're left just in the wind with no clue exactly of how to actually approach the situation. You need to give the players the creative freedom of a tight brief. Give them one or two options which will offer them some starting points which will open up and branch into the actual story itself. Here we have these two. Pacing of events within your scenario is very important to build tension and scope for your actual premise, setting and characters but much of it is based on how long the scenario needs to be. If your scenario is short on word count, it has to be simple, effective and focused on one or two ideas. If you develop too many, you will not have the time to explore them fully and leave the keeper with half-baked ideas, which you'll have to flesh out for himself. You can achieve a slow burn scenario, but it will take a long time to let it breathe and grow in intrigue keeping the players hooked and moving forward without much escalation but more the story and the depth pushing it forward with good character development. In this case there just isn't enough space to do that in most one shots. Every NPC you add which has a major value to the story will add about 300 to 500 in ward count to explore their reasoning for being tangled within that story as well. So just bear that in mind. And with that uh, there's probably three types of scenes that you can explore. Reflective scenes pace your plot properly. You should offer respites from the action and horror and give time for that reflection that the players will need. This will let the keeper and the players both gather their thoughts and this is usually the investigation scenes or the aftermath of some action or event. Here you can still have horror elements and revelations but it is the player that will set their own pace and the direction will be selected by them from this location. Think of this as a crossroads, if you will, giving the players options of how to continue. Proactive scenes are about decision making and moving the plot forward when the players will be endangering themselves and being proactive to solve or discover more about the horrors they are actually involved in. These scenes bookend the reflective scenes, offering high action dread and tension putting the players in harm's way. The, these are the consequences to the scenes from the players mulling over and reflecting on 
what they want to do, what they want to risk, piecing together the reward. Sometimes the plot needs to come to the players and always offer the keeper some sort of roaming event that will seek out the players rather than it, them finding it. This can be used uh, for no roles and for herding the players back onto the reservation should they go off into the weeds and not come back. Once they meddle in a plot, the NPCs should be reacting to them and this is one of the ways they can react by actually going after them and making them, uh, basically booting them out of an investigation perhaps or one of the better ones that I've seen is the gangsters from Crimson Letters. They confront the players and push them to go back to a morgue to find the body of the person they're looking for. This is a blunt tool perhaps, but it can be a necessary one to keep the story focused and the players and the players from becoming lost. It also shows the world is moving around them and that this isn't a video game. The PCs will, won't simply wait to be found. They'll be active and hunting them too. Clues are the bread and butter of Call of Cthulhu and this is something a lot of players struggle with creating for new scenarios. But they're easier than you think. What you need to do here is start at the end and work your way backwards from what happens. So this is where outliners will have a better time of things than say someone who uses like a, a sort of more natural style of like pantsing. Clue chains are usually the framework you hang most of your scenes on as well. So finding out where your clues are going to be and in this setting as well early on is something that uh, you should definitely look at uh, earlier rather than later. You can always fold more clues and more sort of loose ends back into the story and add clues in uh, later on as well, but the f main structure has to be there. To create a clue chain you can use a visual program like Scapple, which you can see on the screen here. Uh, to plot them out in a web-like fashion. You can link red herrings in, you can show multiple threads of logic uh, so you can see all the connections and find bottlenecks and plot holes at a glance. I must admit I don't use this method often and I tend to just do it all in on the fly inside Scrivener as this is just an extra step which eats up time but if you find it useful, use it and it can be very helpful to keep track of larger investigations and ones which are highly complex. One of the things that you'll also notice is if your story is becoming too complex and too overbearing, you can definitely see that happening here too. Do not hide your clues away. You should have obvious ones which are lying out in the open that will be enough for a player to fail to the end. Usually the obvious clues should be the worst clues and the ones which will lead them to having a rough time, a lot of misery and wrong assumptions about what is actually going on. Allowing the players to fail forward until the end of the scenario and it ends up in a, a bit of a failure anyway, but at least get them to the point where they're not stuck and scratching their head. Only by thinking and applying themselves to the investigation will they really understand what the true nature of the investigation will reveal. It, this is one of the, the hardest things to do as a scenario writer. You have to make sure that you're not trying to outsmart your players. That is a very bad idea. You're trying to make sure they have a good time and no matter what their skill level is at playing and you have to cater for every walk of life. They should be thrilled by their discoveries when they find them and wants to peel back more layers if they can, but failing forward is sometimes fun as well. Make sure you don't punish them too hard and give them the, the small glimmers of hopes. Always have a silver lining to your dark clouds. Do not use lots of jargon in your scenarios as well. Do not assume they know what something is. Do not hide the clues in obscure places unless their flavour are not key clues. You might think you're being clever but you're not, you're just being smug. Being a player is a lot harder than you think and you should be playing games as well as being a keeper to keep that in mind. And for the love of God, don't expect the players to read your 20 page journal. They just don't care and neither do I. 
if you can't show the story within the plot itself and have to tell it through an extensive journal, your scenario is a failure. Red herrings are something which are very interesting as well and people often get wrong. Parallel revelations don't have to leave the players cold and be completely out of right field and unrelated to the plot at all. Maybe they can offer a new angle from a different perspective from a different NPC that isn't actually the, the killer or isn't involved directly but did see something that leads people off in a different direction but there is a, a small revelation at the end it's just the wrong one. Uh, these should be used with caution and shouldn't be too complex and not go down the rabbit hole too far but offer doubt if they are cold and pointless then they're just there to throw the player off and make them feel bad. Make sure they have a point and aren't sprinkled around just because you think you need them. These need to work as much as any clue uh, to make sense to the context of the story. Motives and plot conveniences are often its one of the biggest things I think I've found that annoys me. These have to make sense within your story. Uh, if you include the abilities like mind control or possession, you will have to justify who they take and why. Allowing the NPCs such powers opens up a huge scope for manipulation and ways to get what they ultimately want are very easy. So be careful with such things as your players or the keeper will definitely think of things you didn't. I've seen this many times. They shouldn't really happen uh, and shouldn't just be lying around uh, for players to find. Uh, like finding dynamite when just when the PCs need dynamite or having the monster's weakness explained by an NPC just as they go into the room with the monster is just a bit cheap and they should be working for these things and they should develop them naturally. Everything the PC does should be earned and it will be for nothing if they are handed these things too easily. So bear that in mind where you want them to be able to get to the end uh, without huge amounts of uh, trouble. Don't offer them it for nothing. Stats can be your best friend when it comes to adding flavours to NPCs and mythos creatures as Oz skills can inform the Keeper of how they move, act and think. Their abilities show the workings of the person and offer a little hidden tells uh, for them to extrapolate on. Knowing someone as a doctor is all well and good, but showing stats that they're about how good they are is really telling. They could be a terrible doctor and have medicine 20 instead of the medicine 75 you think they should have which really changes the character completely. You can find obscure stats in scenarios like Deadlight as well, where one of the old ladies has apple pie making, uh, for example. This gives the players some texture and flavour to the actual NPCs as well, in much the same way. Adding these little details shouldn't be overlooked. Spend some time with it and craft good characters. When it comes to creatures and creation, never try and balance them to make the scenario fair. To do so is to make each encounter bland and have no tension at all. You should want to terrify them and not make them feel empowered. Completely throw them into the deep end. However, again, stay away from powers which will create no-win situations. The creatures that often come to mind with these are uh, the Lauger. No one should be able to touch that thing. It can sense people's presence for hundreds of yards and can wipe them out with a single thought, yet they don't. Uh, this creature is a no-win creature with, with plot conveniences. While the Mythos's motives should be unfathomable, they should not be idiotic, and this thing should make smears out of investigators as soon as they're aware of them. A threat should be dealt with to the limits of their abilities and powers if required, and usually they just don't. If you want the Mythos to be gentle on them, or not to use the full extent of their powers, you have to come up with a reason that they are either involved or weakened because of some sort of ritual or action, uh, and they're not at their full capacity. Otherwise, it is a plot convenience, and again, 
you're doing a, a disservice to the actual keeper by not fully thinking out what they are actually capable of. At the end of the day, these are my methods and solutions and you will want to find what works for you. There is no bad or wrong advice and no matter who you ask, you will get different answers. You have to find the ones that work for you and discard the ones that don't. As long as the MPs are compelling, there is conflict in the story and the actual plot is intriguing, you are on the right track and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. In a few weeks, uh, you should have a working first draft. Remember, you don't need to show anyone this draft. It might never see the light of day at all, but what you can do with it is test your scenario. And that's the intent of your first draft. Next time, we'll be looking at test playing and editing and feedback for the scenario. And that should be up in a week or so as this scenario is actually finished already. And with that, I shall see you again next time.